Please help me and give me a warm welcome to Mr. Daniel Shoy Jr. Well, good afternoon. It is certainly a honor and privilege to be here with you to spend a little bit of time talking about poverty. But before I do that, before I talk about the East Lake Foundation, I actually want to acknowledge just one guest that I have here this afternoon, and that is my close and dear friend uh, who works here at Georgia Tech. Her name is Birgit Smith Burton. Birgit, wave to everyone. So you should know that Birgit is the Executive Director of Foundation and Corporate Relations, and I've known Birgit now since, for at least 15 years, maybe a little bit longer. I've had the good pleasure of working with her on the um, National Center for Black Philanthropy on their annual conference when it was in Atlanta in 2003, Birgit? Um, and more recently on the Soul of Philanthropy, which is an exhibit on African-American philanthropy and giving. So it's at the Auburn Avenue Research Library, which is just over the hill from here. So I'd encourage any of you to check it out. But Birgit is very approachable and friendly. So if you ever want to know anything about philanthropy and fundraising, Birgit is the go-to person and you have a gem in her on your campus. So we encourage you to get to know her. So thank you for being here, Birgit. And she got me here today because I got a little lost on campus getting here. But with that, I'm going to jump right in. So just do me a favor before we get too far in. Again, raise your hands if you are an, if you are an undergraduate student. Raise them high for me, all right? And raise your hand if you are in a graduate program, which would, I guess, be everybody else, right, by process of elimination. Um, so I want you, as you think about what I'm about to share with you, think about the business case for this model that I'm going to put forward. Um, think about the uh, education lens, for those of you that are interested in education. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, and probably most importantly, I'd ask you to think about the public health lens, and we're going to talk about why breaking the intergener intergenerational cycle of poverty through this community redevelopment work is actually doing health work and what that means. Fair enough? Fair enough? Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm going to need for you to interact with me a little bit so we can, I realize it's late in the afternoon, but I, I thank you all for being here. So if I do this right, Okay, they told me I could point anywhere. Try the other. Up, oh, there we go, right? By process of elimination, I should have figured it was the other button that I was not pressing. So um, I'm going to share a few slides, and I'm going to move through these slides pretty quickly. Can you see the slides if I stand here? Yes, yes. all right. Um, so the scale of poverty in America, when you think about almost 41 million people in this country live in poverty, 41 million people, that is, and I like this slide and this uh, statistic, because that is the equivalent of all people living in Canada and Hong Kong. That's how many people that we have living in poverty in this country. And it's actually one in 10 Americans. I'm gonna show you a slide that talks about children. So when you look, we're talking about of those 40, almost 41 million people, uh, 16 million of those, uh, those people living in poverty are children. Uh, which really, really bothers me when you think about the fact that young people don't control the families or the neighborhoods that they're born into. So that 16 million children uh, living in poverty equates to about one in four American children. Um, and 50% of children that live in poverty are living uh, at concentrated poverty, which means that they're living below 30% uh, of area median income. 86% of these children uh, that live in poverty are third graders who are reading below the grade level. Does anyone know why we should be concerned about children who are not reading at grade level in the third grade? And I know you're a smart bunch, so wh what do we predict in this country based on third grade reading scores? Yes, ma'am. Yes? Prison cells. Prison cells. Prison cells. Did anybody know that? Raise your hand if you heard that for the first time today. Keep your hand raised if you think it's fair that by the time someone is eighth grade, we've determined the rest of their life form. Raise your hand high if you think that's fair. So that's why this should be sobering for you, that we're making decisions for young people as young as eight years old because they will play the never-ending game of catch-up if they're not reading on grade level by the third grade. And that's six out of seven children. Way too many. So I mentioned before that we're going to talk about health work, and I'm going to give you some uh, determinants of health in just a moment. This is an interesting uh, data point from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is a national foundation that does health work, supports health work. 
Uh, and I want you to look, this is New Orleans and these are several different neighborhoods. So this usually works really well when I'm not talking to college students. Am I gonna mess up the taping of this if I move around? Okay, all right, good. Um, so this doesn't work well when I'm talking to college students, unless you're non-traditional college students, because none of you are near the age of 55 or over the age of 55. And for the adults in the room, I'm not gonna dare to ask you if you're over the age of 55, because I know better. But look at the difference in life expectancy. So you're talking about this neighborhood right here, uh, which is where our model's been replicated uh, in New Orleans. And you look here, there's a 20 year difference in life expectancy. You're talking about less than three miles. Less than three miles. So for those of us in the room, I'll be 45 next month, I'm not quite 55, but to think that if you're older than 55, if you lived in New Orleans, that your life would be over if you lived in this neighborhood right about now is also something that I find quite sobering. So when I talk about the non-medical factors that are barriers to health, we talk often about um, health, and oftentimes in this country when we think about health, we tend to conflate it with health care. And healthcare is actually a very small percent of what makes up your overall health. So these are just a few um, stats that you can see. And you can see where the healthcare dollars are spent, largely spent on medical care, disproportionately spent on determinants that actually don't affect your overall health. Um, when you look, I like this because it does reinforce that only 10% of your health is actually influenced by your healthcare. So I'm gonna give you a different way to think about this slide. When we think about our health, we tend to think about what our parents give us um, in terms of genetic makeup. We tend to think about behavior. We tend to think about where we live. And so this genetic predisposition here, and then we think about healthcare, we think about environmental exposure. Well, guess what? When we think about these two elements, this is largely influenced by where you live. Anybody disagree that your behavior might be influenced by where you live? your social circumstances, your environment. And I'd even somewhat say that, and my friends at Emory, which is my alma mater, who are medical school students, would probably argue me to death on this point. But when you even think about your genetic predisposition, I'd also argue with a little bit further research that a clear case can be made that your genetic predisposition can also be determined by the place where you live. So place really does matter. We already talked about this a little bit, that health does not equal health care. So I won't spend a lot of time, but other than to say, when you think about increasing someone's life expectancy and increasing the factors that influence their health, when you think about one's education, income, and neighborhood, so again, it goes back to place, that all these things matter. And I'd even argue here, again, that these two things, education and income, are very much influenced by where you live. So what I want to do is talk to you about a place that's near and dear to my heart, not, because, not only because I'm the president and CEO of the Eastlake Foundation, but I've lived in Atlanta now for 25 years, came to Atlanta in 1991 to attend Emory University. And if you did the math, that's 26 years. There was one year that I moved away from Atlanta for work and uh, moved back. No place like Atlanta. And I want to talk about Eastlake Meadows. So uh, just again, by a show of hands, and, and I don't want to isolate the adults in the room, raise your hand if you were born uh, by 1995. Just raise your hands for me. All right. Now keep your hand up. Keep, raise your hands again. Keep your hands up if you've lived in Atlanta prior to 1995. All right, so a few, only a few for one, two, three, four, five hands. So you may know Eastlake Meadows because it was referred to as Little Vietnam. And it was referred to as Little Vietnam because the neighborhood was really a war zone. And it was home to one of the most violent housing developments in the country called Eastlake Meadows. So I'm going to show you some stats in a second. I'm going to let you read them for yourselves, because I know obviously if you're sitting in this room, all of you can read. But what I want you to think about are how these statistics, um, how high crime, how high unemployment, how low educational attainment all factor in to the outcomes of a community. So you can see, and actually I said I wasn't going to read them, but the safety ones I do want to read to you, that the crime rate in, in Eastlake was 18 times higher than the national average, um, you were more likely to be a victim of violent crime than you were to graduate high school, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, and a $35 million a year drug trade. How does a $35 million a year drug trade exist in a neighborhood, right? I mean, unless you have incredibly smart criminals and they can do it on their own, there has to be a set of systems uh, that allow for something like this to happen. So 
I like to say that people were being entrep entrepreneurial in the old East Lake Meadows, but not in a productive way. This was a neighborhood that was really feeding, a community that was feeding on itself. Then when you look at the housing, uh, it was all public housing in East Lake Meadows. And to think that people were living, almost half of the apartment units that were there were unlivable. The employment, no one believes me when I say this. When I talk about the employment being 13%, people always say, surely you mean that's unemployment. That was 13% employment. The majority of adults are relying on welfare. Um, and I would say to you, when you look at the median income, even if you think of $4,500, and you think about that as income, even if you control for inflation, raise your hand if you think back then that you could live off of that if you were a single parent raising a family of three children. Anybody think they can live off of that? I'm willing to bet that for most of us in the room, that even if we control for inflation, we probably would have a hard time living off of that for two or three months, let alone adults living off of that for a year. And then the education statistics were the most sobering. So the Drew Elementary School that was once there was the uh, poorest performing, lowest performing elementary school. It was 69 out of 69 Atlanta Public Schools elementary schools and one of the lowest ranked schools in all of the state of Georgia. And the CRCT, so where are my people in here? Raise your hands if you think you know education decently well. If you follow education, you don't have to know it really well. So I see a few hands. You probably know that the CRCT, which is our state standard, is a really low bar. So when you think about the fact that less than 10% of fifth graders were able to meet or exceed that standard, and it already is a low bar, it says a lot. So I have a video that I'm hoping if I do this right, we'll play. Two guys got in a fight right close in front of my house. I saw one keep his head around in front of the pile. Davis moved into Atlanta's East Lake Meadows housing project in 1971. It wasn't long before murder and mayhem became a way of life. He ran right by my car and blood was just shooting out, out of his body. That guy shot him and he fell dead right before my face. The 650 unit housing project was never great, but when drugs took over and gangs claimed turf, it went from bad to horrible in a hurry. They would shoot and cut and stab and kill each other. That's what they did. By 1995, the crime rate was 18 times the national average. This was East Lake 10 years ago, and this is East Lake today. Torn down, rebuilt, utterly transformed. Clean, safe, family friendly. This was a pretty hellish place. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's hell. So I wanted to show you that so that you would see what East Lake Meadows looked like. And I promise you that picture that you saw, the aerial view of what it used to look like, was probably taken on a good day in the spring. Because normally, for the residents that lived in East Lake Meadows, many of whom I've kept up with, will talk about what they really remembered was the mound and mound of red clay. This was really a desolate place. Eva Davis was the only president of the Tenants Association of East Lake Meadows. She was, uh, hands down, the biggest opponent of the redevelopment when Tom Cousins came knocking. Any, any of you know Tom Cousins? Raise your hands if you've heard of Tom Cousins before. So you've probably heard of Tom Cousins as an entrepreneur. Uh, he started Cousins Properties, which has built most of the iconic buildings and commercial buildings in downtown, midtown, and Buckhead, and also across the country. You might also know of him because he worked with Ted Turner to bring the Atlanta Hawks here uh, in the late 60s. Um, and you might know a little bit about him through his philanthropy. So Tom Cousins asked his family foundation after two decades of giving, what could they show for all that grant making that they did? And the answer was pretty vague. At about the same time, Tom Cousins read an article in the New York Times that talked about the fact that the majority of uh, criminals in the New York penal system came from eight neighborhoods in New York City. I'm from New York City and I'll tell you as large as New York City is, it's a small portion of the entire state of New York. So when you think about eight neighborhoods in New York City mass producing criminals, filling that, that what I call the cradle of prison pipeline, again, the numbers and statistics matter. Tom Cousins asked the Atlanta chief of police at the time what that looked like for Atlanta, and he said, it's even easier to put your finger on it in Atlanta, six neighborhoods mass produce criminals and no neighborhood more than East Lake Meadows. At about the same time, uh, to give you a sense of the convergence of influences and factors here, 
Tom Cousins learned that the Issei Golf Club, which is a private corporate member golf club that still stands today, it's a place where Bobby Jones played the first game, his first game of golf and last game of golf. It was his home course. And I should see some of you nodding now because I'm sure you know Bobby Jones and the legacy and history with Georgia Tech uh, and the tie here. Um, but Tom learned that the golf club, because the crime in the neighborhood, because of the crime in the neighborhood, that the physical facility had fallen to physical disrepair and the membership had, had tapered off, that it was up on the auction block and was going to become a junkyard. It was going to become a junkyard. So Tom swooped in and did something that I thought was pretty genius. He took his nonprofit family foundation, purchased a for-profit entity, the Eastlake uh, Golf Club, which is that private corporate member golf club I mentioned, and gave it a nonprofit purpose. So here comes Tom Cousins, and I'm going to talk very candidly with you because we're all adults. Tom Cousins, who's white, who's wealthy, who lived in Buckhead, came down to Eastlake, which was 100 percent, Eastlake Meadows, 100 percent African-American, 100 percent poor, and for generations, people like Tom had come to the neighborhood and made all these promises, got what they wanted from neighborhood, whether it was property, whether it was votes, and I'll say that since we're right off of election day, and they left, and they left the neighborhood behind. So Eva Davis was unwilling to trust Tom Cousins. In fact, it took him three years of planning, and if my colleague Carol Norton was here, because at the time she worked for the Atlanta Housing Authority uh, as their attorney, she didn't believe Tom. She was on the other side of the table with Eva Davis, arguing with Tom because she didn't believe him initially. So over three years of planning, Mrs. Davis used her voice, and she used her voice well to pretty much say, hell no, not here, isn't going to happen. But through the visioning process and a lot of hard conversations, meeting once a week for three years, they were able to come together on some common goals and put together a redevelopment plan that essentially resulted in bulldozing the old elementary school that was there and building the, the city of Atlanta's first ever charter school, Drew Charter School. Raise your hand if you've heard of Charles R. Drew Charter School. Good, some of you have. Um, they also tore down the public housing. They knew that for this neighborhood to thrive, it not only needed a strong and high-performing high, uh, school, but it would also need mixed-income housing. And this notion that you could reduce the stigma by not having people of fewer means um, isolated and concentrated in poverty, but instead to allow them to live side by side with working families. Um, so that was also a critical part of the model. So Eastlake, when I talk about the transformative work that we've done, Eastlake is a relatively small community, but our target area of investment here is less than a square mile. Um, I already talked about a lot of this process. I will say that the residents that lived in Eastlake Meadows, while uh, Eastlake Meadows was being bulldozed, um, there was a relocation process that took place while the mixed income housing was being developed. Um, residents set the standards, the vision for what the new community would look like. Um, one of the things that was decided was that if you had a felony or if you had adults who were not working and not moving in a direction to work, that you could not come back to the mixed income housing and live in a subsidized apartment unit. And I say subsidized because the mixed income housing is made possible through a partnership with the Atlanta Housing Authority uh, that you wouldn't be able to return. So of the, and keep in mind, this is 1995. This was revolutionary, revolutionary for its time. Of the families, about 26% of them returned. Seems low is high considering the redevelopment efforts that happened back during that time. Uh, also share that to say that some of the families that could have returned did not return and they chose not to return. And I always honor people's choice because keep in mind for, Families that lived in Eastlake Meadows, they had lived at this point for two and a half decades, experiencing the crime, the bloodshed, the everything else. So they got a Section 8 voucher that allowed them to move either to another public housing development in the city, because they all still stood at the time, or move elsewhere where that voucher could be used. They knew if they were going to move back into the mixed income housing, they would have to surrender that voucher. You don't get that voucher back. So they were taking a chance in believing that this was going to be all that they said that it would be. Um, I won't talk about this because I talked about that a little bit. I do want to talk quickly about our Cradle of College Education Pipeline. We'll quickly say to you in the interest of time uh, that on the, on the front end of it, we have two early learning partners that work with children as young as six weeks old, six weeks through pre-K, and then the idea is that they pipeline into Drew's kindergarten program. And then uh, they will work themselves up our, our Cradle of College Education Pipeline from K through 12, which Drew goes through right now. Um, and the role of the ESAC Foundation that I run is to provide all the resources that students would otherwise not have at this school. Um, 
We are proud of our partnership with the Atlanta Public School System, be it, with, be it not for Atlanta Public Schools and the dollars that we do get. We don't get the same amount of uh, cost per student that the traditional public schools get. Um, we're getting about 3,000 less per student that we educate at Drew Charter School. But again, be it not for the partnership with Atlanta Public Schools, we would not be able to have Drew Charter School. Um, we also promoted community wellness, so it meant having a partner like the YMCA, specifically the Eastlake uh, Family YMCA, new facility in our community to be the anchor for recreation and wellness. Having uh, access to golf was important to the residents, so we are one of two first tee programs in the city of Atlanta. Um, having a grocery store. This, had been, this neighborhood had been a food desert for 40 years. So for folks who are interested in health, think about your health outcomes if you have no access to food. Um, other than the high sugary snacks that you might be getting overpriced at the gas station. And then we also have a program that helps residents uh, to get connected to employment or if they're underemployed to higher levels of employment. Um, the important part of this work was that we decided to create a community quarterback or a backbone organization. For those of you that have heard of the collective impact model, they talk about a backbone organization. That is the organization that I run where the organization that's responsible every day for getting up and worrying, or not worrying, that's, that's me inserting myself, thinking about the cross-pillar partnership that I'm going to show you in this model in just a second, making sure that all of our public and private partners are communicating with uh, each other and the level of accountability. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a young man who was part of our inaugural graduating class from my high school last year. 82 students, all 82 of them graduated high school, all 82 of them were accepted into college, uh, just found out that 85% of them enrolled in college. So we have 10 to 12 students who did not this fall, some who are going in the spring, others who are saying they wish they had made the decision of college instead of work, and now that they're out in the working world. But Alvin is a freshman at Yale. Um, I got accepted to Emory, so I had my fingers crossed that he'd go to my alma mater, but when, em when Yale came knocking, I knew, but Alvin just made, I keep in touch with Alvin, I'm his mentor, once a month, uh, give or take, Alvin made the uh, mock trial team at Yale as a freshman. Very proud of Alvin. So you're looking at the villages of East Lake. Here are the statistics to show you the work that we did over the last 22 years. I've talked uh, about some of this already. Violent, a significant reduction in violent crime. You can see the stat up there. Proud to say that we have 100% of our families that live in the subsidized units are either working or in an education program moving to work. Um, we have 542 units, 271 of them are subsidized, the other 271 are market rate units, so they go for what the market will bear. We have an 1800 student pipeline K through 12. We are in the top 3% of elementary, middle, and high schools in Atlanta public schools. And for our governor last year, there is not a single other school uh, as of 2016, at the end of the 2016 school year, that is predominantly African American, predominantly low income, that outperforms Drew academically. So very proud of that. Um, you can see where we do, where we've done on the CRCT. This is a slide that just shows you over time that our growth has been slow and steady. Um, this slide I always enjoy because these are the in-town schools that we benchmark against. Um, if you look here, this is their percentage of free and reduced lunch. Use that as a proxy for um, poverty. And so, if you take these numbers and you add them all up, we're performing at, if not better, uh, than most of these schools, despite the fact that we have a higher free and reduced lunch population. So for people who say that children from uh, poor families can't learn, this flies in the face of that. And you can see, if I go back there, well, I'm not sure how I go back, but you'd see that we're outperforming Atlanta public schools in Georgia. Those were the two lines there. Proud of our partnership that we have with Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech is our STEAM partner. Think of STEM, I know you know what STEM is, add the A in for the arts. Um, we also have our eighth graders here on your campus for two weeks over the summer after they complete the eighth grade to prepare them to transition to high school. I know that we have two of our students from the inaugural senior class of the high school last year also here at Georgia Tech, and then we have a scholarship here for a Drew alum. $400 million return on investment in terms of the private investment that we bought, so that's the business case. Um, increase in home values, and again, all the good outcomes that show the progress that we made. This is the model that I talked about, so I won't go back through it. Mixed income housing, uh, critical cradle college education pipeline, community wellness, and then the community quarterback, a backbone organization, which is Eastlake Foundation. We very intentionally decided to do this at the level of a city, not to, I mean at the level of a neighborhood, excuse me, not to have it all over Atlanta or at the level of a county for the purpose of effectiveness. 
Our work is the blueprint for now a national organization called Purpose Built Communities that was founded by our founder, Tom Cousins, Warren Buffett, who you probably know, and Julian Robertson, a businessman out of New York, and it is chaired that board by our former mayor, Shirley Franklin. Um, our goal, in my last few slides here, if you bear with me, is to be able to have an impact in 820 uh, neighborhoods that we know have concentrated poverty um, that account for 14, um, 14 million Americans of the almost 41 million that I mentioned before. And so I'm going to skip ahead. This is where Purpose Built Communities is replicating the blueprint, the model that they essentially codified all across the country. I don't know if you can see those stars. Can you see them decently well? Raise your hand if you live in one of these cities. So one thing you can do beyond today is if you're interested, you can email me. I'll give you my email. But if you ask about the Purpose Built Community, or you can go to the Purpose Built Community website and find out the neighborhood in your hometown, get involved. And these are the prospect cities that Purpose Built is working with. So here are some other ways that you can get involved. I'll leave the foundation website up for a quick sec, easy to remember. If you go to our page and you go to the About Us, I am the first person on the staff list. And that's it. So I know I went five minutes over my time. I want to stop at this point and allow you to ask any questions you might have. And I'd encourage you to ask any question. I'm not going to consider any question a dumb question. I think, honestly, the only dumb question is the one that you don't ask. But I'm willing to answer anything. Questions? Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. And if you would just tell me your name. I can. Hi, my name is Jose Araque. I'm a graduating uh, biomedical engineer. Um, so you talked about the four parameters kind of like for success or change over time, kind of safety, housing, employment, and education. Uh, which of those was kind of like the hardest to improve throughout, you know, the tenure from the miracle story from like, you know, the violence to what it is now? So I love your question. So whenever we talk about our work, we always say, I, I worry, and I'm going to answer your question, I promise I will, but I worry because I think in this country we oftentimes look for a silver bullet because we want to get to something at the cheapest, fastest, easiest way. Um, and I would say to you in this work that there is no silver bullet, and oftentimes when it comes to poor people, we tend to think they only deserve one thing. And for me, my theory of change is for people that live in concentrated poverty, if they had the same privilege and opportunities afforded to all the rest of us and they started from the same place, we wouldn't be looking at the reality now. So I would say to you that the hardest, um, for a very different reason, the housing was, was relatively easy, the wellness was easy as well. The most fundamental or critical pillar in this work is the education piece. If you cannot figure out the education piece and if you don't have a high quality option, um, Families that have choice and means, which you need to attract, you want the, the, the market depends on attracting people with choice and means, they don't come to a neighborhood without a high quality education option. Whether you have kids or not, that's just a reality. I think you all know that our local, um, our public education locally is, is uh, funded by property tax, right? So you're not likely to be willing to move in the neighborhood if you feel like that neighbor, neighborhood suffers from blight and is not vibrant if there isn't a path there for the old people, uh, for the young people, excuse me, to be economically mobile. Uh, keep in mind, I mentioned that we were the first ever charter school um, for the city of Atlanta, for Atlanta Public Schools, and I think we were the, one of the first three in the state of Georgia. So charter schools uh, took a lot longer to take root here in Georgia and in the South. And just convincing Atlanta Public Schools back at the time that we could actually turn around this neighborhood and have a high-performing charter school as the anchor for all this work was, was pretty tough, was pretty tough. And as we've grown, by the way, I would also say to you, going back, as, as our results have gotten better, our superintendent that we have right now, Dr. Maria Kristoffen, has been a wonderful supporter, tremendous supporter, and she sees the benefit of giving families and neighborhoods choice when it comes to education. But previously, um, what gave me gray hair, and ultimately what probably caused me to lose a little bit of gray hair I had, was continuing to make the case that choice is important and that charter schools are one of the options in the choice conversation in what's good for families, students, and communities. Other questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll just have the mic. So hi, I'm Courtney. I'm a fourth year computational media major here at Tech. Um, I absolutely loved your talk, and I really appreciate it. Um, 
being a girl in the Heights in Brooklyn, um, from in the Heights in Brooklyn, New York, um, I completely understand the whole life expectancy um, thing that you were talking about with New Orleans. And I couldn't help but notice that it's all about things that are near the tourist part, like the French Quarter and things like that. So do you think that tour tourism and gentrification has to do with this income problem? And how do you think that you can fight that as like this may or may not grow in people? So two ways I'd respond to you. Um, so the neighborhoods, purpose-built communities tends to go into neighborhoods that invite, that invite them to come. They don't pretend to parachute in with the solutions because neighborhoods are these things that are not static, that evolve over time. Um, so they are pro bono consultants. They don't charge for their services. Uh, and thanks to the generosity of their board members, founding board members, um, they're able to do this work pro bono. So they're very thoughtful about going into these neighborhoods at these neighborhoods invitations and then uh, working with them. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, as you mentioned, some of the neighborhoods have some kind of um, economic engine. In the case of Eastlake, I often get asked if it were not for the golf club, and I, and I should have mentioned, by the way, that the early money to do the capital redevelopment of this uh, 22 years ago um, came from Tom Cousins' uh, family foundation, but also because he had this genius idea that if he could use the golf club, which he purchased, uh, his, his nonprofit purchased, um, as an economic engine because it had had a historic relationship and significance to that community. Um, but if he could use the golf club in a different way, and if he could, well, I'm not sure what I did there, if he could have the corporate members of the club do something a little different, which is that they paid a one-time initiation fee, um, they pay annual dues, but then they also made this one-time charitable contribution in the amount of $200,000. So think 100 members all doing that $200,000 contribution that gave the early capital. Um, New Orleans is the only other place where golf is actually involved. There is a course there now that was recently converted into a public course. Um, but other than these two places where golf happens to be a resource, a natural resource in that community, everywhere else these neighborhoods are making it work by the business community, um, through public and private partnerships, uh, through engaging and mobilizing residents. So I want to say that first part, that you don't need tourism. Uh, and, and actually, in some of these places, you don't have tourism that is able to drive this kind of redevelopment. The second thing that I'll talk about quickly, and the gentrification word tends to be the dirty word when you talk to folks about community redevelopment, I would say to you, and this is controversial, that Eastlake certainly has suffered some gentrification. We've been uh, uh, victims of our own success, and there have been some unintended consequences. And in a city like Atlanta, where everyone is figuring out how do you increase affordable housing, um, how do you keep you know, whole cities and neighborhoods affordable? We're tackling that now. Um, my most recent strategic plan uh, is taking a strategic look at how we, how we make the uh, neighborhood more affordable and how we also ensure that the resources that we already have there now, because as families with choice and means have, have flocked to Eastlake, if we don't pay attention, it would be easy for them to, um, how can I say this in the most appropriate way? It'd be easy for them to marshal and corral those resources for themselves, and that's anti-mission and not mission aligned with the work that I do. Um, so I would say to you again, the key here in, in successful community redevelopment is that you displace as few people as possible. I can't think of a successful community redevelopment model where some folks are not displaced, because again, as I said before, the market tends to respond when you have uh, people of choice and means that have some disposable income to drive market forces. I, I don't know how to say that in any other way, but again, you minimize the amount of, uh, of uh, disruption, well, the amount of, of uh, dislocation of people that are originally there. We know that our model is disruptive, and I'm never going to be apologetic about that, because you look at the status quo, and without something that disrupts that status quo, it never changes. Other questions? Yes, sir. So accountability for us means having uh, MOUs and having in agreements in place. Um, I will tell you, I've been at the East Lake Foundation now for seven years. Um, I, I don't know if it was mentioned in my intro. I worked at the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. I think all of you know Arthur Blank is the owner of the Atlanta Falcons, one of the founders of the Home Depot. So I was a little, already a little familiar with uh, East Lake. Um, but when you talk about doing community work like this, and again, keep in mind, 
the folks that did this, I was not there 22 years ago, were pioneers. A lot was done on good faith, the handshakes. Um, over time, we realized, no, no, you actually have to treat this like a business and actually have a binding agreement and commitment with partners to do the work that they say they're going to do. The other way that accountability plays out is if I look at all of our partners in our cradle of college education pillar, what they are best at doing is education. It doesn't mean that they don't care about where their kids come from um, and the social well-being or economically well-being of their families. It means that every day, and Drew is extended day and extended year, so our school day starts at 8, ends at 4. You could actually be there at 7.30 if you come for the uh, breakfast program, uh, which is open to all kids regardless of income. And then we have an after-school program that serves a little more than half of the elementary school from 4 to 6. So it is a working parent, single parent's dream not just to put their kids in a safe place, but in a place where they know that they're being enriched. But to answer your question, at the end of the day, our education partners are neatly focused on education. Our housing folks are neatly focused on housing, and then the wellness folks are all focused on wellness. They, be it not for the Backbone Organization, the Eastlake Foundation, would work in silos, and they're only worried about their outcomes and not looking up to see where their outcomes intersect. So that becomes another accountability piece. The last thing I'll say, and Birgit will appreciate this, is someone who wants to raise dollars, we are able to get the money that we get from organizations like the Gates Foundation, like the Woodruff Foundation, like the Blank Foundation, because they know that we are a model um, and an innovative model where we can test things and be a beacon for disseminating best practice. So when they give the ESAC Foundation support, let's say if it's for Drew Charter School, they don't look at it as, oh, I'm supporting one school. They look at it as, I'm supporting a model that can transform uh, other traditional public schools. In fact, I didn't mention when I was talking, and there wasn't a slide up here, uh, Purpose Built Community spun off an organization two years ago called Purpose Built Schools Atlanta. Raise your hands if you've heard of Thomasville Heights. Anyone know Thomasville Heights, Thomasville Heights Elementary School? Purpose Built Schools Atlanta is one of two not-for-profit organizations that won a long-term contract, 14-year contract with Atlanta Public Schools to turn around uh, four schools in the Carver Cluster uh, Thomasville Heights is actually worse than Drew Elementary School was at its worst. Uh, it's one of the lowest performing schools in, it is the lowest performing school in Atlanta Public Schools, uh, one of the worst in Georgia and has been that way for a decade. Um, so the accountability piece means that we are the good housekeeping seal, you invest in us, that we say that we're going to be the ones to make sure that, we, that our partners doing the work on the ground are going to achieve the outcomes. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, my name is Andrew, by the way, and I appreciate Thank you, you coming to speak. Um, my question would be is, what are some of the metrics that you use to determine that the intergenerational poverty is actually being broken rather than relocated? Good. So we are looking at a few things. Um, we're looking at income and change in income uh, annually. We're looking at graduation rates. A uh, 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 college degree is a high indicator uh, that you've broken the cycle for a family. Uh, and I, when I say broken the cycle for a family, we say in ESAIC that we allow families, so let me say it this way. I don't know if any of you will remember the State of the Union where President Obama, former President Obama, spoke about uh, economic ladders of opportunity out of poverty. So the way that we're set up, keep in mind I told you that our mixed income housing is 50% market rate, 50% uh, public housing units, so subsidized. We say that we're helping people to move uh, in so if I need to live in a subsidized unit, I have that resource and I get the highest priority of all the amenities. I should have said that at the outset, that I have the highest priority to get into the charter school. I think you all know, and I should not have assumed, that charter schools work that if you have more interest and you have space, the school goes to a lottery. Well, what we did was very intentionally, and Andrew, I'll come back to your answer, what we did very intentionally that I didn't explain here in the details is we give the highest priority to our families that live in the villages of Eastlake, Second highest priority to uh, families that have children that live in the neighborhood beyond our mixed income housing. And then third priority to the city of Atlanta. Uh, you have to live in the city of Atlanta to go to Drew because we are part of the Atlanta public school system, uh, plain and simple. Um, so I, I, I say all that to say that when I think about the metrics, being that we have a K-12 pipeline and these early learning partners, we are able to see our young people progress and move up through that pipeline. Um, but Again, if they're moving in, if they're moving up in their housing status, whether that's that they're moving from a subsidized unit to a market rate unit and eventually to their own home ownership and eventually out, children don't do that on their own. So it means that we also have to be concerned about the outcomes for their families. 
Um, it's helping their family members, adult family members who may not have completed high school to get a GED. It's helping them to get jobs. So those are, are some of the metrics that we use, income, employment, um, edu educational attainment. And because of the way that we're set up, Andrew, uh, we will, through a long-term partnership with the Atlanta Housing Authority, always be, always have units and resources and amenities preserved for people of the lowest income, so that will never go away. So at any moment in time, there are always people who are moving in. Yes? Hi, my name is Nick. Um, I recently read uh, Jeffrey Canada's my um, biography, you know, the Harlem, Ch That's right. Harlem Children's Zone. Yes. And he talked about like the difficulty with investors in charter schools, how you measure success with test scores and things like that. So how did you all deal with um, keeping, I guess, the integrity of the students in the schools mm -hmm. with managing with investors and running like a business? So Jeff is a friend of our work, um, longtime friend, lots of similarities in our work, some stark differences, uh, I would say, as well, in the way that we went about our work. Um, so one of the ways, again, uh, because we started out very intentionally early on saying that our model is holistic and integrated. And holistic doesn't mean that you do everything. It means that you're thoughtful about the sets of things that you need to do to get to the change. Um, so because we've had the good benefit of having this Cradle of College pipeline, I should have mentioned before that we have um, low uh, uh, or high student, I hate the word retention because it gives the wrong impression, but we have low student attrition, that's what I'm looking for, and low teacher attrition. So it's easy to track um, the progress of our students. Um, I struggle a little bit because we do test our students a lot. Um, we do take the, had been taking the CRCT. For those of you that follow education, you know that's been replaced by the Georgia Milestones. Uh, milestone. But we don't only want to know how our students are doing compared to other students in Georgia. We want to know how our students are doing on nationally norm reference tests. So we do still take the ITBS and the um, NAEP. Um, there are also sets of uh, social, emotional things that you also measure for, so that at the, the end of the day, you're not creating this high stakes testing environment that has students completely uh, stressed or, or overworked. But, but, but there's a delicate balance there, because when it comes to metrics, if educational attainment is one such metric, then the, the biggest indicator is going to be how they score on standardized tests. Um, and whether or not they're, they're graduating, which is why I'm able to uh, uh, tout with a great deal of pride that we had 100% graduation in our first graduating class from, from our high school. Other questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Emily, and thank you for coming today. So I guess I'm a little more curious about you and your leadership style as well. And I know you mentioned you went to Emory. So what sparked you to get into the sector, and do you feel like your higher education truly prepared you for what you're doing today? Okay. So I may never be asked back after I answer your question, for your professors might shake their hands at me and say, so I was a history major uh, at Emory. Um, was one class short of being history and psychology major. And because I liked torturing myself, I was pre-med. So I had to take all the core requirements, uh, which was a nightmare. I got to my junior year. Uh, I was at Emory at a time in, in the early 90s where the uh, uh, population of students of color was relatively low, um, particularly for the, the black students at Emory. So I got to know students at Emory who were years ahead of me, who had left Emory, graduated Emory, went on to med school, and they would come back and they'd say, do you really want to go to med school? I'm miserable as a resident. Even knew a handful of people who had gone through Emory much before I did, completed their residency, did fellowships, started off into practice, and then decided that they did not want to practice medicine anymore. So I started thinking about what I really wanted to do with my life. I am first generation American to immigrant parents from the Caribbean. And when you are the child of immigrant parents, they live vicariously through you and you pretty much do what they tell you to do. So since I was seven years old, my mom had said my son's gonna be a doctor. I, all my siblings are older and they're all Caribbean born and uh, somewhat Caribbean educated as well. So I knew that I wanted to make the world a better place, thought that I was gonna be Atlanta's next best pediatrician. And I realized through service opportunities with my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, um, that there were other ways that I could impact the lives of children. Um, found out about this neat AmeriCorps program um, uh, hands on Atlanta, where I got to volunteer at a local middle school, uh, and one literally through all the not for profit organizations that I worked for, either as an AmeriCorps member initially or as a staff member, it further affirmed that I did not want to go into practicing medicine. 
Um, do I use my psych and history de degree or, you know, could I have majored in anything and, and probably still ended up here? I think absolutely yes. I'm a big believer, and I say this to our high school students all the time, and their parents frown when I say this. Um, I'm careful with the way that I talk about intellect and, and uh, being smart. Uh, being smart doesn't mean just getting good grades. Um, I think college, if you get a good college education, it teaches you how to think and how to process the world around you and people around you. Um, I know a lot of people who have great book sense and have no common sense. I have some of them in my family uh, that I talk to all, all the time. So, um, but I'm sure if you're at a fine institution like Georgia Tech and if you are in a class like this and if you're involved in your community, either locally or back home, that you have all the tools and skills that you'll need to be, to be successful um, beyond, beyond uh, college. And um, again, just very grateful for my path from Hans Atlanta to the Blank Foundation and ultimately Blank Foundation to, to Eastlake. I, I take this work very seriously. So when I have my um, uh, Emory alum who were at Emory with me who've gone on to be doctors, many of them who stayed uh, in the field, or lawyers, or they make jokes and they say, you know, those who can, you've probably heard this before, going to medicine, you, you know, those who can't teach are going to nonprofit. I push back hard on that um, just because I believe that this is very serious, committed, thoughtful work that is helping to change uh, the country and change the world. Other questions? Yes. And I'm watching our time because I know that we end at 530. All right, so we're good for a few more minutes. Yes, Hi, my name is Chris. Um, so in the beginning of your presentation, you talked a lot about health. Yes. Um, so have you measured or what ways have you seen changes in life expectancy or overall health of the community in Eastlake or other areas where this model has been implemented across the country? So I'm glad you asked that. So let's address the latter part of your question. Of the 18 communities where purpose-built communities is uh, using this model, so Eastlake Foundation is the founding network member in the genesis of this national network. Eastlake Foundation is the furthest along. The next two furthest along are Indianapolis and New Orleans, and they are, so Hurricane Katrina happened in five, six, so they are a little more than 10 years into their work. Um, and when you're in the earliest stages of this work, you focus on the capital uh, improvement that needs to happen, building the mixed income housing, uh, building the high school, Certainly we have the benefit of having a uh, cradle of college education pipeline fully realized that didn't happen overnight. Because uh, I mentioned we just graduated our first high school class um, earlier this year uh, in May of 17. So our health work, when we talk about health and wellness as a pillar, largely that work was economic wellness, it was uh, food access and dealing with food insecurity. Only in the last three years have we delved into physical health and wellness work. And uh, because we're only three years in, we have some early indicators that our Eastlake Healthy Connections program is, has been a successful pilot, but we haven't had the longitudinal span of that health work yet to be able to talk about uh, a difference in life, and life expectancy. Um, but what I will say to you is if I look at life expectancy, uh, what it was back in 1995, and I think about the seniors who moved into the villages of Eastlake when it opened in the late 90s after it was built, and a, va a fair amount of them still around, so something has worked and something has changed the trajectory to allow them to live well past the life expectancy that they would have had had the neighborhood not been transformed. So, so uh, uh, Nick, right? Chris. Chris, Chris, to be continued on your question as we have a few more years into doing our physical health and wellness work. We have probably have time for one final question. Yes. One final. Yes. Uh, my name is Kira. Uh, thank you for coming I think this is maybe a good wrap-up question. Um, what challenges are East Lake, the Eastlake Foundation and purpose-built communities facing today as you are you know, 20 years into the implementation of these models? So I would say to you quickly that the biggest uh, challenge that we face is we say that this is well, I'd say this the way that Tom Cousins says it, and I know you're college students with adult ears, and uh, Tom is a very frank person, but I would say that, that, that we say that this is not work for the, the faint at heart. This is not work that happens in a grant cycle. So that sometimes is a challenge as I'm raising resources. We have a $5 million annual budget. Uh, a little more than 50% of it comes from something golf-related that we're grateful to have the Eastside Golf Club as a resource 
Tour Championship, if any of you keep up with golf, gives us a fair amount of money. Our Celebrity Invitational, an NCAA tournament that we do. Actually, Georgia Tech was in the men's tournament in the Issei Cup last year, which was the second year of doing that. But as I have to raise that other two and a half million um, dollars, sometimes it's a challenge to explain to a funder, this is, you know, you give me a one-year grant or you give me a three-year grant, I can give you progress outcomes. But for the longer range outcomes and goal of this work, it's not going to happen over a short amount of time. Um, I would say another big challenge is protecting the resource. So I have well-intentioned families who will say to me all the time, you know, the biggest issue with our work is that they all can't get into Drew Charter School. Um, and then I remind them that, again, our mission says that we protect the resource for those who need it the most. Our elementary school, well, Drew, once upon a time when it was only, only elementary school, was 100% uh, African American, 100% free and reduced lunch. Today, after the, the last school year, we're now down to 42% free and reduced lunch. Um, so the diversity, economic diversity and racial diversity is good, but the economic diversity is what keeps me up at night because I'm raising private dollars to say that we're helping kids who otherwise would not have this resource when in fact we have more um, students that are of means and great means who are tapping into the school. So it's, it's keeping that balance, that can be uh, really tough. And then the last thing I'll say is the affordable housing piece. So I'm really excited, I wish I could share, we're close to making a very public announcement on uh, new and exciting development that we're gonna have coming up in ESAC that will increase the affordable um, inventory um, to have more people be able to take advantage, more people of fewer means take advantage of the resources in Eastlake um, but that's something, again, that I think about all the time because if you've moved into the neighborhood in the last nine or eight or nine years and you say, I moved into Eastlake, bought a home for my kid to get into Drew, but they can't get in because there isn't space. Or if you say you've solved the problem of poverty, why would you want to bring more people of fewer means here? That sometimes is a little bit of a challenge to have those conversations in, in neighborhood and to reinforce our, our mission and what we're supposed to be focused on. All right, so please give another round of applause to Daniel. Thank you so much.